Hey, welcome to the weekly service from the Elim Church in the Holm Valley. We're glad that you've joined us on uh, YouTube or live here at the, at, I nearly said the Village Hall, but it's Trinity Church at Moorbottom in Honley, whilst the Village Hall is being used as a vaccination centre. It's holiday season. A number of our folks are on, away on holiday, so we're going to pray for them right now in Jesus' name. We, Father, pray for our folks away on holiday. We pray that they would have a refreshing time. And Father, as they have that restful time, that they would have a revelation from you. In those times of quietness and relaxation, may they consider your beauty, your love for them. And may you speak to them in a fresh way. So that it's not only a physically refreshing holiday, but a spiritually refreshing one too. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our girl's going to say something. Amen. Thank you. Good evening. I'm just going to read you a scripture, 1 John 4, 4. It says, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. It's a scripture probably that most of us know well, and yet we can read it quickly and perhaps just gloss over it without really giving it a lot of thought. But let's just consider what it means to have the greater one living in us. Hallelujah. 1 Chronicles 29 11 says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. And yet, great as he is, he lives in us by his Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1 19 to 21 tells us, that he raised Jesus from the dead by his mighty power. And Romans 8, 11 tells us that that same resurrection power is resident in each believer. Wow. You know, Doctor Who and his TARDIS have nothing on you. You are far greater on the inside than you are on the outside. Do you remember when Jesus went up the mountain and was transfigured and uh, three of his disciples were with him and it's as if the veil of his flesh was drawn back and the disciples saw his true glory there on the mountain. That same Holy Spirit lives in the spirit of each born again believer. That's amazing. But you may say, I, I don't feel his power, I don't feel his presence. But feelings are a part of our soul, our mind, our will, our emotions, so we can't feel our spirit in the same way as you can feel or sense what's going in and on in your soul. But we receive what God has said in his word by faith, and by faith we draw out his power. When circumstances rise up against you, or the enemy comes to try and knock you down, rise up and speak out God's truth. Greater is he who is in me. Picture God's Holy Spirit, glorious power shining out of your spirit, far greater than anything that can come against you. Open your mouth and start to praise him and worship him. And by faith, allow the greater one to go to work, hallelujah, in your situation. Lift up your shield of faith and the sword of the spirit and stand firm. When the enemy comes against you, Resist him, he will flee, because he is no match for the greater one who lives in you. Amen. Let's listen or join in with our first song. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at his feet. He has done great things.
Then what could stand against? And if my God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? What could stand against? Our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God. Just reminded of that scripture right now that uh, if God is for us, who can be against us? Hallelujah. Just want to encourage someone here tonight, somebody perhaps watching on the video, that whatever your situation, God is on your side. And if God is for you, who can be against you? Hallelujah. <laughs> Oh, you are 
So uh, here we are, here's Sylvia, and Sylvia's got a blessing for us this evening. Well, I'm very nervous standing up here, <laughs> but um, the Lord did a great job on me this week, on Wednesday. Yeah. He laid, I, I had hands laid on me, and he completely healed me. Comple well, I've, I've still got a little ache in my arm, but I think that's just the So what did you have, frozen shoulder? Yes. Yeah. Well, no, it was um, tendon in my arm, in my elbow, and one in my shoulder. Right. But I've had it for months. Right. Months, and it's been very painful. Well, thank you, Lord Jesus, for, for healing me. I am so thankful, Lord. I can't say how thankful I am. You're such a mighty God. Amen. And I thank you so much, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. And the wonderful thing is that what, what, what God has done for Sylvia, God can do for you. Hallelujah. Because God is a good God. He's a great God. He's an awesome God who does marvelous deeds. So perhaps we'll sing that refrain again. For you are great and do marvelous deeds. And we'll proclaim thanks to God for what he's done in Sylvia's life as we sing that. But also... By faith, we will proclaim it over ourselves as well for the needs that we have in our lives. Maybe it might not just be a, it might not be a, a physical problem that you are encountering as a challenge this week, and and you need to know God as a great God who does marvelous deeds. It might be other situations, other challenges that you're facing. Well, as we sing this, remind yourself that God is a great and awesome God. There is none like him, and he is able, more than able, because he is God. Thank you, Jesus. And as we've already said, if God be for us, who can be against us? So let's stand and sing that refrain again, and, and thank God for what he's done in Sylvia's life. And by faith, just receive for the need that we have in our own life as well. Amen. For you are great and do marvelous seeds. Yes, you are great and do marvelous seeds. Yes, you are great and do Bless you, Lord. We give you thanks for what you've done in Sylvia's life. And Father, by faith, we give you thanks for what you're doing in our lives and are going to do in our lives in the coming week. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. How great are you, Lord? How great is your mercy How great are the things that you have done for me How great are you, Lord Your loving kindness Is still in my heart as I sing How great are you How great is your love, it reaches to the heavens. How great is the heart that sought and rescued me. How great is your love, it reaches to the heavens. How great, how great. 
Thank you. <laughs> Praise God. So, here it comes. So we're looking at Paul's letter to the Ephesians, written about AD 64, thereabouts, perhaps five years or so uh, earlier than that, written from prison in Rome, and as we've said, a letter full of theology, full of stuff that is relevant for us today. Uh, in fact, as we look at all these doctrines, even what we look at this evening, we're just going to need to scratch the surface, but you know, we'll probably revisit the themes that we're going to touch on this evening because they are recurrent throughout Paul's writings and recurrent throughout this letter. So even tonight may be an introduction to a, a theme of redemption, a theme of forgiveness, a theme of original sin and, and being free from the law, we'll revisit it and we'll revisit it and we'll revisit it again. So we perhaps will just touch on it this evening, but don't think that we've, hopefully, uh, you might not catch it the first time, but as we go again and again and again, the truth will sink in and the Holy Spirit will reveal it to us. So this written, this, this, this letter is written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, profitable for teaching, correction, equipping of believers today. And just to say that the Bible is the foundation of what we believe. Here it is, 2 Timothy 3.16. Every scripture, all scripture, is inspired of God, is also profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, which is in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. It is everything that we need. If we want to know what to do in life, if we want to know the answer to a problem in life, the word is in the word of God. The answer is in the word of God, in the scripture. And it is the basis upon which we uh, base our faith. Now, a lot of denominations might have in their doctrinal statements about what they believe, they might say that the Bible is just something that can be referred to. Uh, and they might say that it was written thousands of years ago to different people in a different age, and we should adapt what it says according to modern thinking. And that, the, and that their tenet is that the church should reflect the views of modern society. But my argument, my argument is, is that the church should reflect what God says. And it's not that God has to catch up with contemporary thinking. It's not that the church has to catch up with contemporary thinking, but it's contemporary thinking that needs to catch up with God. And many people might argue, well, today is different. We have different attitudes towards uh, sexual morality, just as, as one example. Well, back in the time that this was written, Rome was the sin capital of the world. Ephesia, uh, Ephesia, uh, Ephesus wasn't much better. And, and all kinds of shenanigans were going on, a lot worse than they were going on today. And when Paul wrote the letter, he didn't say, well, to preach the gospel, I better tone it down and adapt what I'm saying to make it acceptable to all these people that are listening. 
No, he spoke the truth inspired by the Holy Spirit. And likewise today, uh, we need to base what we believe upon the Word of God inspired by the Holy Spirit. God's Word is timeless. Attitudes shift. God's Word does not. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's words will remain, says Matthew 24, 35. So, so far in our studies on Ephesus, we've looked at the first six verses. Ministry starts with God. The blessing starts with God. Our praises start with God. Our holiness starts with God. Now we get to verse 7. In him, we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. So verse 7, in him, this is referring to Jesus. Our redemption, our forgiveness, and we'll look at these words in a moment or two, we'll explain a little bit more what redemption and forgiveness is all about, but let's First of all, see what Paul is saying. He's saying that these are found in him, in Jesus. Nobody else, it's in him. They're not found in Buddha, they're not found in Muhammad, they're not found in an organisation, whether it be a religious organisation or whether it be a political philosophy, an organisation, a political organisation or a philosophy. Redemption is not found in cutting carbon emissions, it's found in Jesus. <laughs> Don't get me on that one. Salvation. The only way that we're going to save the planet is by cutting carbon, carbon emissions. Well, <laughs> the only way that the planet is going to be saved is if it turns to Jesus, because in him there is redemption. In him there is salvation. Now, I'm not saying that we haven't got to cut our carbon emissions, but our salvation, the answer is not in us, the answer is in Jesus. And it goes back to what we've been going, uh, saying about a, a, lot, a lot over the months, that the answer is not in what we can do, but in what Jesus has already done. In him we have redemption. The Baptist preacher Spurgeon said, we have nothing apart from Jesus. Salvation is found in no one else. Acts 4.12 says this, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. So again, this is the reason why at the uh, beginning of my message, I prefaced it with the comment that we believe in the Bible and what the Bible says, because uh, progressive Christians or some denominations would say, well, Jesus is one of many routes to salvation. And that different religions are all climbing up the same mountain and when we get to the top, we will all find God. The Bible says that salvation is found in no one else but Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. If you think that there is another route, you are mistaken. Whoa! We can't believe what the Bible says. Well, we either believe that what the Bible says or we are lost. Because if we're not believing what the Bible says, we are making up our own religion and our own ideas. We don't base what we believe on our own ideas, on contemporary thinking, but upon what God says. Okay. In him, we have redemption. Now, redemption means, um, the word means deliverance by payment of a price. It was a word that was used in Paul's day uh, in reference to the slave trade. Uh, in the Roman world, uh, uh, um, uh, slaves were bought and purchased. They were redeemed. They were paid for. Uh, they were set free. They were purchased by somebody else and they became a property of somebody else. Um, there was thought as many as 60 million slaves in Rome, in the in Roman Empire. They were treated like property, not as human beings. Now, let's make a few observations about slave or slaves or perhaps one basic observation about a slave and that a, a slave cannot free itself. 
they are never in a position to save up enough money and cut a deal with their master. So if you're a slave and you're slaving away uh, and you're being whipped by your, your master and you're not being paid anything, you just live in existence and you just get food and they, your master just uh, uh, exploits you for the labor that you can give. If you're in that position, you are never in a position to be able to earn enough money to say, hey, Master, uh, here's the money for me to go free. Because you can't. You, you're not in a position to do that. I remember, as a, a very young child, being a little bit confused. Because I heard um, that it, historically, before you could uh, declare yourself bankrupt, if you owed a debt, you'd be thrown into prison until that debt could be paid. And I remember, as I say, as a young boy thinking to myself, well, how can that be if you are in prison? How can you earn enough money to pay your debt so that you could be free? And of course, the answer is that you can't. It needs somebody else to come and pay the price. The only way a slave was going to be free is if someone else comes along and buys you back. Someone redeems you. Redemption. In Jesus, we have redemption. He is the one who has bought us from slavery. Now, you might be there sitting and thinking, well, there is another way a slave can be free, and that is that they could run away. Well, it's true, but the, the, if the slave were to escape there would be a price on his or her head. They may be free, but not really be free. And so again, we can make that illustration or, or make that connection that sometimes people think that they can find freedom in some kind of um, yoga or, or sitting on the top of a mountain and humming or, or I, I'm not being... <laughs> Or they can find freedom in, 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 in having a lot of money, find freedom in sex, find freedom in alcohol, in drugs, or, or whatever. But they are not really free. When the slave ran away, there would still be a price on his head. They would be free, but not really free. And it brings an extra dimension, an extra understanding to that scripture, John eight thirty six, which, which says, He who the Son sets free is free Indeed. When Jesus sets us free, he sets us free indeed. So what has Jesus set us free from? What slavery has he set us free from? The slavery of Satan. Adam and Eve sold themselves out to Satan in the Garden of Eden. They turned their backs on God and allowed Satan to become their master. When Adam sinned, he died spiritually. Satan became his master, and by nature he became a slave to sin, and by nature we are slaves to sin. Anybody and everybody in their natural state before they're redeemed is a slave to sin. And you might say, well, hang on a minute, that was Adam who sinned, not us. But remember, slaves cannot free themselves. If a slave has a child, that, that child is not free, that child is also a slave. What does it mean to be a slave to sin? It means that by very nature, we are sinners. It's true from the very day that we were conceived, the very day that we were born. You don't have to teach a child to do wrong. You spend a lifetime teaching a child to do that which is right. By nature, our propensity, is that the right word? Our uh, tendency, perhaps a better word, it, is to do wrong. Stick a child in a kitchen in front of a table full of cakes and say, don't eat it, the child will eat it. Because their tendency, their natural tendency is to do wrong. Our natural tendency is to be selfish, to look after number one. We don't care about other people, we care only about ourselves. We are sinners to the core. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It means however hard we try, we will never be good enough. 
in our natural state. But here's the good news. Because Jesus redeemed us, here's Romans 6, 6 to 7, scripture on the screen, we are no longer slaves to sin, we were set free from the power of sin, sin no longer is your master, Satan is no longer your master, instead you live under the freedom of God's grace. What else has God, uh, uh, Jesus paid the price for to flee us from the slavery of? He's paid the price to flee us from the slavery of the law. Galatians 5.1 says this, Christ has set us free. This means we are really free. Now hold on to your freedom and don't ever become slaves of the law again. What does it mean to be a slave to the law? It means that you think that by being obedient to the law, you can find peace with God, that you will be acceptable to God. But the law was never given so that if we obey it, we will be accepted by God. The law was given to show us that we were no good to recognize that we need a redeemer. The law was given to turn us to Christ. But sometimes, even born-again believers think that they have to obey the law to be accepted by Christ. Um, almost become like a modern-day Pharisee. Now, the Pharisees have got loads of rules that you have to keep, um, 613 of them, I believe, and all kinds of rules that you keep have to keep today to be accepted by God. And I think one of the uh, illustrations that I've used in the past is that the... the, the, the very strict Jew would say that on the Sabbath today, you can't pin a baby's nappy, um, a diaper for those people who are watching from overseas. You can't, you can't clip, you can't pin the, the nappy because it's work. And you can't take the, but if you, and if you use a disposable one, you can't take the tape off the sticky bit on a Sunday. So, or, or on the Sabbath. So before the Sabbath, the mother has to get all the nappies ready for the next day and take all the sticky bits off because the, taking the sticky bit off on the Sabbath is deemed to be the law. We laugh at that kind of thing, but then Christians think that they have to do things to earn brownie points. They think that they have to perhaps read so many chapters of the Bible, earn a brownie point, earn a star, and then go to God and say, hey, I want to redeem this star. I want to uh, get, redeem my prize. And I want you now to answer. Now, I've earned an answer to prayer. I've earned your favor because I've done this, because I've done this charity work, because I've helped an old lady across the road, because I've put some money in the collection, because I've smiled and been kind to somebody, because I've done something for somebody else, because I've done something charitable, something good, inverted commas, then I deserve to be accepted by God. But we become slaves of the law because whatever we do is never good enough. We try and we try and we try. Years and years, we say, well, I've got to help out at this, I've got to help out that, I've got to give here, I've got to get that. Then may God might forgive my sin, he might accept me. And you just end up chasing your tail, going round in vicious circles, because you will never be good enough, because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And as a result, we become slaves to the law. Galatians 3.10 says this, For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. You see, Jesus lived the perfect life so that we didn't... Uh, he, Jesus lived the perfect life. He fulfilled the law because we couldn't. He paid the price where we couldn't. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. It's Jesus. Not about what we can do, but what Jesus has already done. 
And then also the Bible talks about being a slave to fear. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. So what are we afraid of? People can be slaves to fear, afraid of dying, afraid of the future, afraid of tomorrow, afraid of not having enough, afraid of growing old, afraid of other people, afraid of circumstances, afraid, afraid, afraid. But when we are redeemed, when we give our lives to Jesus, when we trust in what he has done for us on the cross, his Holy Spirit resides within us and we no longer fear anymore because we have that reassurance, we should have that reassurance, amen, that he has provided everything that we will ever need. Here it is, 2 Peter 1.3, it's not on the screen. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and good godliness. So we don't need to fear death because we have eternal life in him. We don't need to fear tomorrow because God has a plan for us as we looked at last week. We don't need to fear circumstances because God is on our side. Who is, if it, God is for us, who can be against us? We don't need to fear about not having enough because God has, provided, has already provided everything that we need. There is no need to fear. We should be people that live in peace. And I tell you something, if you are being... Being blunt here, can I be blunt? You know, if you are not living in peace, if you, if you are living in fear, it's because you do not recognize that you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus and that he has paid the price and that he is on your side. If redemption means deliverance by the payment of a price, how has Jesus paid the price? How is it that he has redeemed us and set us free? Through his blood. In him we have redemption through his blood. Now, <clears throat> here's another controversy within the modern, the modern day Christianity that many people are offended at. And I'll explain that in a minute. Um, Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, or we could say the consequences of or the result of sin is death. If God declared the wages of sin is death, but then waved his hand and said it didn't matter, that would compromise his perfect justice. It would be like a, a judge who told a murderer, okay, well, we know that you've committed this heinous crime, that you've murdered all these people in the village, and every year you've murdered somebody on the 1st of May, and you've done it for the last 50 years, and we've finally caught up with you, the Honley Strangler, and, oh, but we're going to let you off. There would be an outcry, wouldn't there? There would be an absolute outcry, and rightly so, because justice would not be served. And likewise, when it comes to our sin, God just cannot say, oh, it doesn't matter. Hebrews 9.22 says this, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And this takes us to Leviticus 17.11, where God explains, for the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you on the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood by reason of life that makes atonement. Now, atonement is a big word. It means being put right with God. To be put right, it means to make amends. So in this context, the blood of Jesus puts us right with God. It pays the price for our sin. It sets us free from sin. It sets us free from slavery. It sets us free from the law. And it sets us free from fear. So when Paul writes, in him we have redemption through his blood, he's pointing back to the Old Testament sacrificial system where animals were sacrificed and their blood shed on a regular basis to make amends for the people's sins. And here it is from Hebrews 10. The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come. 
not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under the system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshippers would have been purified once for all time, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it's not possible for the bull, blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That's when, why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, look, I have come to do your will, O God as it is written about me in the scriptures. scriptures. He cancels the first covenant in order to put the second into effect. For God's will for us was to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Now the problem for modern Christianity today, not us, it's not a problem for us today, but we need to talk about it, the problem for many Christians today is that God, if he is so loving, would not do that to his son. Now, as I've already said, uh, justice has to be served. There had to be a price. That was paid. God is a just God, and to compromise justice would be a miscarriage of justice. So they said, say that killing Jesus on the cross is cosmic, cosmic child abuse because Jesus is God's son. This is awful. God would never do that. But here's the question. If you are not trusting in Jesus' blood for your redemption, for your forgiveness of sin, what are you trusting in? And then here's another question. If Jesus did not die on the cross to pay the price for your sin, why did he have to die? What was his death all about? And it's interesting when you talk to people who don't believe that Jesus died on the cross for their sin, have all kinds of weird and wonderful answers ranging from he had to be killed because he was a political agitator or because he, it was perceived that he'd fiddled his tax return. Um, and then you ask them, well, what was his death all about? Well, Jesus was just showing us to love one another, to humble ourselves and to live our lives for other people, and that we need to be loving and compassionate towards others. Well, that is true. But that's not all. And they think that the idea, the way that you connect with God is by doing the things that Jesus would have done. So if Jesus was loving and compassionate, well then you do the things that Jesus would have done and then you connect with God. You do this, you do that, you do this, you do that, then you connect with God. Can you see again? You become a slave to the law. It all becomes about you and what you have to do so that you connect to God and get accepted by God. But the way that you and I are accepted by God is not about anything that we do, but by the blood of Jesus. It's not about obeying a bunch of rules. Jesus died on the cross to save us from the bunch of rules. In my research for this message this week, I came across lots of people who said that Paul was wrong and that Jesus had an identity crisis and that the Bible is wrong. And all these people call themselves Christians. And I think it's them who've got an identity crisis because they don't know what Jesus has done for them. This is what we can call a Christian. Someone who can say, in him, in Christ, I have been redeemed. I have been set free from Satan, from sin, and from the law, and from fear. The price for my sin has been paid by Jesus' death, by his blood, and now I am forgiven, blessed, 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 
not because of anything I have done or anything that I can do, but because of everything that Jesus has already done for me. Well, that sounds too good to be true. <laughs> it's marvellous, I agree. It's what you call God's grace. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of his grace, nearly done, that he lavished on us. Let's just say a few words about forgiveness. Redemption means being delivered and freed from sin's power so that it no longer rules over us. We're no longer slaves. Whereas forgiveness means God wipes the slate clean. The bearing away of all our shortcomings. So, as some, uh, so that our sins, as someone has put it, no longer hang over us like the glistening blade of a guillotine ready to drop at any moment. And I think the Forgiveness is perhaps illustrated by this, that on the, on the Day of Atonement, uh, um, uh, carried out once a year on the Day of Atonement, when the high priest sent the scapegoat into the wilderness, the priest would kill the first one of two goats. There were two goats that were killed. The first would be the blood of the first goat would be, would be sprinkled on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. Then the high priest would confess Israel's sin over the live goat and would have this goat taken out into the wilderness and lost. It's a picture of how our sin is sent away and lost, never to be remembered, never to be seen anymore, never to come back anymore, gone. Psalm 103, 12 says this, As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. How much have we been forgiven? Completely. Does God remember? No. For I will be merciful towards their evil deeds and their sins I will remember no longer. Clara Barton, the founder of the American Red Cross, was reminded one day of a vicious deed that someone had done to her before uh, her years before. But she acted as if she had never heard of the incident. Do you remember it? Her friend asked. No came Clara's reply. I distinctly remember forgetting it. <laughs> and this is what God does with our sin. He distinctly forgets it. According to the riches of his grace, and I'm done. How infinite is his grace? It cannot be calculated. The riches of his grace cannot be exhausted. No sin we will ever commit have committed, will commit, are committing, is too big for God to forgive. There is no sin that cannot be forgiven. There is no sin that is greater than God's grace. Do you mean that everyone is forgiven? Well, we have to accept by faith what Jesus has done for us. Simples. I'm not trusting in my works. I'm not trusting in my own effort. I'm trusting in God. But when you do ask him, he forgives abundantly. According to the riches of his grace, which he freely lavished on us, I think is what one version says. And I'll conclude with this illustration. I don't know whether you've ever been to an Italian restaurant and you'll have a pizza. And because the Parmesan cheese is so expensive, the waitress or the waiter won't give you a dish of already pre-grated Parmesan cheese because she doesn't want you to help yourself because it's too dear. So she will grate a little bit on your pizza, enough just for you to recognise that you've got a dusting, if that. That's a mean measure. When you lavishly give something to somebody, you would say, here's... Here's a pot of Parmesan cheese. Help yourself as much, to as much as you want. And if you want some more, I've got some more in the fridge out the back. And if you exhaust every bit that I've got in the fridge at the back, I'll go to that well-known supermarket down the road and get some more. And if they run out, they'll order some more from their warehouse and they'll get some more in. And if more than enough. 
pay the price for our sin, for your sin. The sin of yesterday, the sin of today, and the sin of tomorrow. In him, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We'll just listen to this next song and uh, remain seated. Jesus who died on the cross to pay the price for our sin, to set us free from the slavery of Satan, from sin, to set us free from the slavery of the law, to set us free from the slavery of fear. Thank you, Lord, that you have paid the price with your blood that is more than ample your grace is so lavish that it covers our sin of yesterday, today, and forevermore. All we need to do is stop trusting in ourselves and trust in you. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, again for that truth. It's not about anything that we can do, but about everything that you have already done. Thank you for the riches of your grace which just again reminds us that we are blessed, 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 blessed by the best. Amen. Amen. If you want to know more about what it means to be a Christian, uh, why don't you send me an email and I'll gladly chat with you, send you some literature and pray for you uh, that you might know God's peace in your life and his joy, hallelujah, and that freedom from fear. If you want to call us or gal, you can call us on 01484 323 uh, My mobile is 0747 277 Have I said info at hvelim.org.uk as well? That's my email. Bless you. Thank you for joining us this week. And until we see you again next week, don't forget that we love you. God loves you. God's on your side and that we're blessed by the best. Amen. 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 Praise God. <laughs>